uh, thank you for the introduction and hi everybody. Um, so. In recent years, video clips which contain spectacular aerial footage overflow the internet. Nevertheless, taking these aesthetically pleasing shots is quite challenging. What you can see on the slides is normally recorded by professional with highly specialized equipment, and what you can't see is that their quadrotors are normally operated by two operators. One is steering the drone, and the other one is steering the camera. In contrast, drones on the consumer market are normally, de are normally designed for single users, and of course, especially novice users, struggle with steering the quadrotor and the camera at the same time. The following video exemplifies this. So on the video, you see many sudden movements, first of all, in the orientation of the camera, and then later on, you see sudden movements in the flight of the, of the drone. And as the quadrotor approaches the operator, you see how he struggles to constantly shift his focus on the quadrotor and on, on his remote, where he can see the camera view. Um, yeah. <laughs> and although he's excited in the end, the whole procedure looks kind of tense. And the result is, of course, not, has not the same quality we saw in the beginning with the professionals. Um, to overcome this problem, we present a design tool that allows users to sketch a quadrotor flight plan. Out of that generates a feasible trajectory, allows users to edit and iterate over the trajectory until they are satisfied with the result, simulate the flight, and finally, execute the flight on a real quadrotor. Yeah. Our work is related to a series of papers about computational design tools, for example, for 3D printable robots, toy kites, or model airplanes. Like our work, these tools optimize subject to models to achieve functionality and leave users the control over the aesthetic considerations. Uh, a work which shares the same goal as our work is an interactive tool for designing quadrotor camera shots by Schubert Robert Sedal. Um, in contrast to our method, their method does not automate feasibility checking, but delegates the correction of violations to the user. This means the following. So imagine this is, uh, these are keyframes specified by a user. So this is a user-specified trajectory, and their optimization now generates a trajectory which, which is infeasible. So basically it looks like this. Then it's the user's task to adjust the keyframes in a way that the trajectory becomes feasible. To be able to automate feasibility checking, we formulate the keyframes as soft instead of hard constraints, and thereby the optimization method is able to trade off feasibility against keyframe matching. And in our case, um, the generated trajectory would look something like this. So it's basically the feasible trajectory which is closest to the user-specified input. Um, before we get to our method, let's first talk about what physical feasibility really means. Um, first of all, we have to understand how a quadcopter m moves in space. So to hover, all four rotors produce an equal thrust. If we now want to move from position one to position two, we need to rotate by driving the rotors at different speed. After we have the desired rotation, we can, we, we can then equal fr equally thrust all rotors to move to the, to the position two. And this dependency of rotation and translation means that not at all times the full force budget is available for the quad rotor, and this is of course something we need to consider when we want to generate a trajectory. When talking about trajectories, we of course have also, we also need to talk about velocity. If we fly slow enough, we can basically follow any input. This is what you can see on the slide. So the quadrotor has no problem to stay on the trajectory. But if we now fly the same trajectory fast, he will be not able to produce enough force to keep to be on the trajectory. And this is of course something which is crucial if you want to do uh, aerial videography. So. Um, to come up with an algorithm that enforces physical feasibility, we need a mathematical description of a quadrotor and its physical capabilities. Um, what you can see here is the full nonlinear model of a quadrotor. Uh, 
It models all six degrees of freedom and the nonlinear underactuated dynamics of a quad rotor. It's highly, uh, it's well studied and extensively used in robotics literature. The only problem is that using this model in an optimization method results in, uh, in runtimes which are far away from anything you can use in an interactive design tool. Uh, therefore, we approximate this model um, with a linear model, which has, it has four degrees of freedom, and it's basically a directed mass point model. Um, it models the position of the quadrotor in 3D space and the force acting on the quadrotor. And it also models the yaw angle on, around the set axis of the quadrotor and the torque acting on, the quadru uh, on, this, on this yaw axis. Yeah. Um, what you can see here is the formulation uh, of the linear model with x being the state vector with position and yaw angle and u being the input with force and torque. Even though this model is very simple, it does not limit us to very conservative lights. If you're interested, uh, please read the paper. We, we describe this in more detail there. And Benny is now going to explain you how we use our, uh, this model in our optimization scheme. Okay, so uh, let's uh, quickly recall the um, the workflow that we've seen in a previous slide. So the first thing a user has to do, the first step is to sketch a trajectory that he wants to fly. So from this sketch, we extract a set of sparse key points that you can see in green. And each key point is the position at a specific time point that the quadrotor should pass. So when we generate a trajectory, we want it to, to look somewhat like the violet curves that you can see. So it should pass through the key points and be smooth. And to do this, we first have to represent uh, the trajectory, and we do this by discretizing time into small steps. They are shown here as gray lines. And each of these uh, time steps has a corresponding state of the quadrotor. So it's, there's a state x1, x2, and so on. And each state is composed of the position of the quadrotor and its velocity at the corresponding time point. Now, we want to measure for a given trajectory if it matches the key points that we got from the user. And we do this by defining a cost term that's the sum of the square distances between key point and quadrotor position at the corresponding time point. So this now allows us to, to judge whether a trajectory matches the key points that we got from the user. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to incorporate the model equation that you've seen before. And we do this by first discretizing it. This gives us a simple linear equation that couples uh, the state of the quadrotor at a time point with the input and the state at the previous time point. So we rearrange this a little bit. So there's a zero on the right side. And now we write this down for the whole trajectory. So we first stack together the states and inputs of the quadrotor for the whole trajectory into a big vector here called x. And then we write down the model equation for each time point. So what we end up with is a very big sparse matrix with a block diagonal structure. And each block is simply the model equation that you can see in the middle. So when we, if we now combine this big system of model equations with the cost that we um, defined before, we end up with an optimization problem that has a cost that's quadratic and uh, equality constraints that are linear. So this is a simple quadratic pro program, and you can solve it with standard software packages. And if we want to, we, we can also include now um, limits of the quadrotor of our quadrotor model, such as maximum acceleration, by adding inequality constraints to this problem. So this already allows us to uh, generate uh, trajectories for a number of use cases. And here we show you an example of light painting where a user sketches the, the painting that he wants to show, and then we capture the flight of a quadrotor equipped with an LED using long exposure photography. And as you can see, the resulting trajectory is, looks really nice and smooth. And of course, light painting is, is really it's nice, it's great. But what we really want to do, as you've seen in the introduction, is we want to film with a quadrotor. So we have to um, extend our model with a gimbal, and the user now, in addition to the key points where he specifies where the quadrotor should fly, he now also has to choose what the quadrotor should film. So he has to specify target positions. And one example is this house that you see here. So if we want to film this house, 
we need to measure how well the camera of the quadrotor is, is capturing this house. And we do this by introducing a penalty term. And the penalty term is simply the angle between the camera direction and the target direction. And again, we define a cost term by summing up the squared penalty terms, and we combine it with the previous cost to get a final optimization problem. The only difference now is that this is not quadratic anymore, but uh, it's, it's uh, non-quadratic, it's non-convex, so we have to resolve to an iterative scheme to solve this. Um, if, you, if you're interested in this, you can look in the paper and read about it in a little bit more detail. And the nice thing about this formulation is that the user can also now specify different target positions throughout the trajectory. So the target does not have to be fixed at one, one position. Okay, now um, you s we show you an example now of a generated trajectories out the camera cost. And as you can see in the inset on the right, on the upper right, the camera can just point anywhere because it's not constrained. And if we include the camera cost, uh, the camera is always pointing at the castle. So it's always capturing the target. Now, an additional um, objective that we included tries to minimize perspective effects. So you see this, this crest that was filmed from above, and it, it doesn't really look nice. So what you really want is something where the crest is filmed from the front, which looks much more pleasant. And again, we do this by introducing a penalty. In this, in this case, a penalty depends on the relative uh, distance of the target and the size of the target. And again, we sum up the penalty. We combine it with the other cost terms to get a final cost function and can then generate trajectories that fulfill all the objectives that we uh, put in. And I show you, we show you an example now what this uh, cost is doing. So the user first selects key points by clicking, and then he can drag the mouse towards the target position that he wants to film. And afterwards, he can modify the key points. And now we move them up high above the castle. And the, the perspective cost will now push down the generated trajectory to be low and around the castle. Okay, and now Christoph is showing you his final results. So, in the first shot, we want to show you we try to film a toy castle by flying over it. The challenging thing here is that the quadrotor position and the camera orientation are never constant, and still we want to keep the camera target in the, pers uh, in the field of view of the camera. Um, executed on a quadrotor, this looks like that. So as you can see here, the quadrotor, above the castle, the quadrotor has to rotate 100 degrees, and still the camera target is not lost, as you can see in the inset. In the second shot, we have two uh, camera targets, and here the challenge is to have a smooth transition in between them. On the real quadrotor, this looks like the following. So you approach the two camera targets, you focus first on both of them, then you uh, have a smooth transition to the left target, afterwards a tr smooth transition to the right target, and then the quadrotor flies out again. So if you, if you would reproduce the same videos manually, this would probably uh, need several attempts to achieve the same quality, or two operators, one for the camera and one for the quadrotor. So as you've seen, the, the results that we've shown you are all indoors using a motion capture system. So nevertheless, our method is not inherently fixed to this uh, constraint, and it can equally be applied to a flight outside with GPS or other localization techniques. A limitation that comes with the approximate quadrotor model that we use is that we cannot generate highly aggressive trajectories. Um, and despite this, as you've seen, we can generate trajectories for uh, aerial light painting, videography, and also aerial racing. And as Christoph mentioned, there's some more detail in the paper on the actual limits that this approximation brings with it. Um, another limitation of our approach is that we assume static sceneries. So if you think about action filming or sports filming, you actually want a moving target that you can film, right? Um, so this is a big drawback. And we are currently um, investigating uh, scenes with a single moving target. Um, and we, uh, 
use ultra wideband radios to localize the target relative to the quadrotor, and this allows us to follow a person or fly around a person. So to conclude, we've shown you a user in the loop design tool for generating aerial robotic behavior. And at its core is an optimization-based algorithm that combines quadrotor constraints and high-level human objectives. And this allows, finally, the user to, <coughs> to concentrate on the visual and aesthetic aspects of the filming. So with this, we want to thank you for your attention, and we are happy to take any questions. Hi. Daniel Ashbrook from the Rochester Institute of Technology. This is really cool work. Um, it occurs to me that uh, a lot of times you might have a hard time visualizing the scene as you are as you're trying to do this modeling. So I'm wondering about um, allowing the human to step into it while it's executing. You know, I plan it in the lab, and then I take it outside to actually execute, and I say, well, this is good up to here, and now I want to move it a little bit as it's flying, and then let it resume the path somehow. Have you thought about something like that? So, so you mean like doing this while, while running, right? Come on to the microphone. Oh, sorry. So <coughs> you mean uh, being able to modify the trajectory while you execute it? Right. Yeah, and this, we haven't done this, but this would be interesting uh, future work. And yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Any more questions? So I, I have a question. So and I think you mentioned a little bit of that in, at the end of your talk. So the system seems to be very dependent on, on a robust tracking system, right? That's why you have a special space uh, set up. So what, what technologies will you need to enable to, to use uh, your, your work uh, outdoors for, with real cameras and a real uh, scene? So... Um, so basically, the, the approach we use, uh, the pr approach we developed is independent from the localization technique, so it would be able to use our method also with GPS, with normal GPS data. Of course, then you have to, m you, you're basically not able to fly as close because of the uh, accuracy differences in GPS and the motion capture data, but the method would work with GPS as well. Mm. Okay. All right. One more question? One more question. Um, the other thought I have is, um, can you take the a given trajectory of a uh, quadcopter as input and then smooth it out, make it nicer, allow the user to ma manipulate it? So if I fly outside and I say, well, that was kind of okay, but I didn't do a very good job flying or I didn't do a very good job pointing, now can I refine that with your system and then set the quadcopter to go and do a better version? Yeah, um, basically you could sample the GPS points of the of the manual flight, and actually our method would do this automatically. We have a we have a smoothing term in our optimization function, and if you if you have uh, the samples, like imagine every three seconds uh, take the GPS localization, run it through our algorithm, we would automatically have a smooth trajectory of what the user intended to fly. Yeah. yeah thanks.